Welcome, First Term Nursing students, uh, Nursing 103, Chapter 75. Without further ado, let's get into this. This is uh, Skin uh, Issues and Disorders. And I'm going to share a screen here and we'll get going. Okay, come on. Here goes slideshow. The computer's fighting with me today, uh, as usual. So, chapter 75 skin disorders. Start off, integumentary system. All right, the largest organ in the body. You have the epidermis and the dermis, as you're picking up in bio and all of its accessory organs, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, nerves, and all the glands. Common terms for skin disorders, abrasion, uh, fell down, scraped your knee, that's an abrasion. Dermatitis, all right, you've got an itis, uh, as you're learning in medical terminology. Um, itis is inflammation, so this is inflammation of the skin. Desquamation, eschar, uh, that would be the black, nasty uh, things that you find in wounds. Excoriation, uh, you'll often find this uh, in uh, patients who have a lot of uh, moisture, um, those that, are, that wear briefs. Uh, so you've got moisture and acidity, and uh, it can lead to excoriation uh, if you're losing the uh, top layers of the skin. Laceration. Um, now, the laceration uh, is generally done by a jagged edge. Um, difference between an incision and a laceration is generally intent. Um, incision is done with a clean edge, uh, with, uh, with a smooth edge and a laceration uh, would be something that would come accidentally. Puritis and purpura, itching and uh, purplish, uh, purplish discoloration. For diagnostic tests, you've got allergy skin tests, the uh, scratch tests. Uh, those of you who have allergies may have uh, gone through these to see what it is you're allergic to. Uh, where the skin is scratched with a needle uh, that has been dipped in an allergen. Um, laboratory, laboratory tests for blood diseases. Blood glucose tests for diabetes. Wait a minute, but that's blood sugar. What does that have to do with skin? Diabetes can uh, greatly impair healing and lead to infections. Uh, wood lights, zinc smears, biopsies. Scabies scrapings, uh, these are all diagnostic tests uh, that will look for skin disorders. Common surgical treatments. You got plastic surgery or reconstructive surgery, uh, some done for, well, it's all done for appearance, uh, but some done to uh, restore appearance uh, due to injury and others to enhance appearance. The cosmetic effects, uh, repairing the results of trauma, <clears throat> skin and tissue grafts. So um, patients, especially uh, burn patients or those that have lost large areas of skin due to trauma, uh, will have uh, skin grafts done. Now there are different types of grafting that uh, that can be done, and we'll uh, we'll look at those here in a little bit. Uh, but uh, the skin is transplanted, not full thickness necessarily, but a, uh, the upper layers of skin uh, transplanted to form a matrix for the patient's body to grow in and around to provide, provide a, uh, a framework, if you will, uh, for the skin to repair itself. Uh, the types of grafts, free graft and a pedicle graft, um, where skin is uh, taken and uh, moved to a new place or a flap created. 
So for graft surgery, pre-op, um, you will be explaining to the patient or the client um, what they can expect both during and after surgery. Post-operative, very important, paying very close, um, very, very uh, obsessive attention to aseptic technique. Uh, you have to protect those grafts because they are just laying on the tissue at this point. So we don't need that. We don't want them disturbed. We don't want to introduce bacteria that can impair healing. And if you're getting a skin graft, that means you have a, a break, a portal, portal of infection um, that is large enough to require grafting. Uh, so aseptic technique, protect the grafts, keep them immobilized, and this may involve casting. Um, and then at the donor sites, so if you have shaved off a layer of skin to place it somewhere else, not a, you don't have just one wound now, you have two. And uh, again, another portal for infection. And then emotional support and reassurance. Um, these can be painful surgeries. Um, they can also be somewhat disfiguring depending on the reason for the graft and its location. Uh, burn patients especially uh, may require quite a bit of emotional support. Puritis, itching, often a symptom of skin disease. Now, I've talked uh, already about portals for infection. Right? If you have intact skin, you have protection from invasion by microorganisms. If you have a patient who has uncontrolled itching and they are scratching a lot, they may break the skin, which then may lead to infection for that patient. Uh, proper use of medications, anti-anxiety drugs are sometimes used, antihistamines to knock down the inflammation response, or topical corticosteroids. These need to be uh, given as ordered, or if the patient is taking them themselves, taken as ordered. Uh, with the anti-anxiety drugs, the antihistamines, or topical corticosteroids, that's not a really frequent administration. Right? Uh, and then, of course, your standard precautions and your transmission-based precautions. Transmission-based, well, if your patient has scabies, um, they would be on contact precautions, and you would not want to, A, get scabies yourself, and B, pass scabies on to your other patients or your family members. So standard precautions, transmission-based precautions, hand washing, use of PPE, <clears throat> baths. Yes, baths can be therapeutic, not just the bubble kind. Um, so you get medication to the whole body if it's a medicated bath. Uh, cleans the skin, removing irritants, promotes wound healing, may relieve itching, helps to remove from wounds that, uh, that black and dead tissue, that eschar, or escher, depends on where you trained and who you trained with, how you pronounce it, and warmth for physical therapy. Uh, patients with musculoskeletal injuries um, or undergoing physical therapy for uh, musculoskeletal disorders or injuries um, will often get these uh, warm baths, maybe just to the area that is uh, that is being worked on, to promote blood flow and uh, allow uh, more ease of movement. Whirlpool, whirlpool baths um, increase circulation, helps to remove the dead sin, skin cells, promotes healing. Um, keep in mind, though, that uh, your patient um, should not be dipping their, uh, their feet in the hot tub. 
Um, if they've got a wound on the foot and doing the whirlpool baths of therapy, they need to understand that uh, their hot tub is not necessarily the uh, cleanest of environments or the greatest protection from infection. True story. Dressings, moist dressings, okay, not soaking wet. Soaking wet can cause maceration of the skin and uh, increase tissue damage. Moist dressings reduce swelling, uh, can soften and remove crusts without having to go in and manually debreed, and may relieve itching and discomfort. They can be uh, clean dressings, they may be sterile dressings, depending on the tissue underneath. If the skin is intact, uh, then it would be a sterile dressing, or I'm sorry, if the skin is intact, it would be a clean dressing. If the skin is not intact, you should be using a sterile dressing. So what do you think, true or false? Therapeutic bath to a client, should you use soap? Three, two, one, false. Medicated bath oil instead of soap. Soap's dry, uh, which can not only aggravate itching, uh, but it can also lead to uh, uh, more fragility of the upper surfaces of the skin, and uh, it will be easier to get a break in the skin. Oh, and our buddy hives, urticaria. Raised pink to red areas, they itch and they burn. Uh, very often as a result of allergies, can be as a result of stress, um, or contact with an irritant uh, that the immune system is responding to. Uh, with this uh, chronic hives, um, or also angioedema. Angioedema can be uh, can be a life threatening situation, and I uh, I urge you to just do a Google image search of angioedema, and you can work out why this could be life threatening. Vitiligo. So areas of the skin completely lacking pigmentation. Uh, the reason we have pigment is to uh, protect us from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. Um, in areas without melanocytes, there is no protection. No melanin, no protection. Uh, burns easily and uh, the tissues, the cells may be, uh, may be damaged and become cancerous. Uh, treatment for this can be mini grafts um, or transplantation of melanocytes from other areas of the body. Eczema, aka atopic dermatitis, can be hereditary uh, as a result of allergy or a um, uh, an emotional stress or a noxious stimulus from the environment, uh, an irritant that gets onto the skin. Uh, treatment, uh, moisturizing creams, corticosteroids to reduce inflammation, tar solutions, um, starch baths. Um, some of you may recall uh, hearing about oatmeal baths for chicken pox. Um, and that's to reduce the uh, inflammation and itching from the box. Uh, again, you've got starch in the oatmeal. Um, antihistamines may be used and anti-anxiety drugs, uh, both to treat the cause of the itching and the effect of the itching. Imagine, uh, if you will, you're itching and you never stop. Could that cause some anxiety? Psoriasis. Uh, chronic, very important here, non-contagious. It's a proliferative disorder. The skin cells are, re are reproducing rapidly. Um, and this uh, causes those plaques that you see. Therapeutic baths, uh, 
wet dressings, in this case wet dressings because you are trying to break it down, uh, lubricating ointments to help slough the uh, proliferative skin. Um, specialized shampoos, corticosteroids, ultraviolet light treatments, burning with UV. Um, and then there are also um, chemotherapeutic agents like retinoids and methotrexate that may be used to treat psoriasis. My apologies, I am not nearly caffeinated enough at this moment. So what do we think? Is angioedema associated with hives extremely dangerous? If you said true, you were right. Can become life-threatening. Uh, we talk about the ABCs. ABCs in this case, airway, breathing, and circulation. And how it works is if you don't have A, B and C don't matter. If you don't have an airway, you won't be able to breathe. And circulation is secondary. Um, so, in cases of angioedema, where it's uh, impacting the airway, this is, in fact, very life-threatening. How about infections? Right, warts. Caused by the human papillomavirus. We can treat these with electrodesiccation, uh, the application of what I like to call Edison medicine, as in Thomas Edison. Um, curettage, cutting them out. Cryosurgery, freezing them off. Um, or keratolytic agents, kerato, keratin, lytic, or lytic, um, lysis, splitting. Bacterial skin infections. Impetigo, oh, that's a scary one. Um, well, not so much scary as just unfortunate because it is very contagious and uh, tends to spread amongst children rather quickly because they don't wash their hands and they like to touch everything and put things in their mouths. You may get well now. Um, those of you who have kids uh, know all about this and those of you who don't have kids yet, well, just wait. <clears throat> Folliculitis, uh, inflammation of a follicle uh, can be due to uh, bacterial infection around the follicle causing inflammation and pus formation. Um, so you might have a, uh, an ingrown hair, um, a uh, zit, that's, that's, a, that's a good term for it, around the hair, um, or leading to furnicles and carbuncles, boils. Uh, these are infectious. Uh, it has gotten deep enough to uh, cause a pus pocket uh, in the skin and uh, you get a raised, very uncomfortable um, area of the skin. Parasites. Ah, uh, yes, scabies. Uh, and uh, if you're like me, anytime somebody says the S word, you start to itch. These are tiny little mites that uh, burrow under the skin. Uh, you get it through close personal contact, um, say patient care. Uh, they can be transmitted not only uh, from skin to skin contact, but clothing, linens, towels, um, anything that the patient might touch that uh, will provide a, oh man, I am itching now. Um, that will uh, provide a ready reservoir for these guys to live on until uh, something comes along that they can eat. Um, and that would be us, by the way, they like to eat us. So with this, baths, um, removing crusts, protecting the open infected spots, and keep in mind that if you have an open spot, um, an opening in the skin, you can uh, easily get an infection. And the application of the prescribed medication to the entire body. That uh, cream contains primerethrin, which is an insecticide. So you are pretty well dipping your patient in 
insecticide or rubbing insecticide over their whole body. Lice. Well, what to say about lice? Um, we all know that they're over the counter or prescription medications. Uh, however, there uh, is a newer trend toward uh, lice that are becoming resistant to common treatments. They're becoming resistant to NICs, NIX. Um, these, uh, this is a little more concerning because what's left after uh, after the medications don't work is a flamethrower. Um, bed bugs. Uh, these are interesting little creatures, easy to uh, easy to spread. Um, the bites appear in groups of three. And before you ask, I do not know why they bite in groups of three. That's just what they tend to do. Um, and it may often be the uh, the difference uh, in identifying uh, bed bugs versus, say, flea bites. Is fleas don't tend to bite in groups of three. Bed bugs do. Don't know. Um, so menthol and phenol and or hydrocortisone cream to the bitten areas, uh, and um, getting rid of bed bugs uh, in your client's house may be quite difficult um, and it may require uh, professional uh, professional assistance to get rid of the bed bugs once they're there so what do you think if the patient has a parasitic infection and lives with their family. I'm not talking, you know, grandma who lives in uh, in Detroit. Um, you know. Should we treat the client's family as well? If you answer true, you were correct. Especially with scabies, they can get into clo into clothing, bed clothing, so sheets, blankets, um, and personal clothing. You want uh, immediate treatment to kill these guys off, the scabies, not the patient, um, to kill them off to hopefully prevent the spread. Sebaceous glands. They become plugged, form hard little nodules uh, that we may uh, refer to also as zits. Um, these uh, can become quite large and in some cases may require surgery to remove them. Seborrhea, uh, so it, um, excessive sebum being produced. Seborrheic dermatitis. Um, Seborrhea is something you uh, parents you may uh, recognize. So forms large scales or cheese like plugs on the body. Cradle cap. Okay. Not necessarily a disorder that is just how they're developing at that point and uh, not um, not washing thoroughly enough, uh, scrubbing baby's head can cause cradle cap. Right. Cerebrate dermatitis, scaling of the scalp, you know, into dandruff. Okay. Dandruff being the dry form of cerebrate dermatitis. Now we get into something really interesting, burns. Um, we're just scratching the surface here as far as burns and burn treatments. So with burns, you do need to think about the mechanism of injury um, as, as to how deep or how bad or what the treatment for the burn is going to end up being. So thermal burns, stuck your hand in the fire. Um, electrical burns, uh, keeping in mind with an electrical burn that if you have uh, an electrical burn 
on one part of the body, there may be another on the on another part of the body because electricity will travel the path of least resistance from its source to ground. Um, so a patient may have an electrical burn on their hand, uh, but keep looking because there may be another burn elsewhere where the electricity has exited the body. Um, and also keep in mind that electricity with electrical burns, it will, it can kill tissues in a tunnel going from the point of entry to the point of exit. Chemical burns. Uh, so you've uh, been exposed or, or splashed, uh, acidic, basic, um, anything that uh, is going to be damaging to tissues. And radiation. Uh, radiation also includes sunshine. Yes, a yes sunburn is a radiation burn. We would look at burn depth and size. Is it a partial thickness? Did it go uh, just one layer of the dermis? Is it maybe just epidermal? Uh, partial thickness, uh, so you have uh, first and second. And then full thickness, where you have a third degree burn, where it is all the way through uh, the structures of the skin and into the underlying tissue. First degree burn, think of a sunburn. Second degree burn, think of a sunburn with a blister. Uh, third degree burn, uh, you could think of um, uh, exposure to flame that has charred tissue all the way down to the subcutaneous tissue. Um, in your book, it covers the rule of nines uh, as far as figuring out how much percentage of body area is burnt. Um, one thing I do want you to think about is when you are, uh, if you are uh, taking care of a patient who has come in with burns to their face or to their chest, you want to be very, uh, very cognizant. You really want to be looking at their airway because if you've got a burn to the face or a burn to the chest, the airway is right there. And burns can cause inflammation. Uh, burns can cause tissue damage in the airway. And uh, with tissue damage and inflammation, swells up, you lose the airway, you don't have A, B and C don't matter. Still thinking about lice. Um, so phases of burn injury. Uh, you have the resuscitative phase uh, where you are basically saving the life. Uh, the resuscitative phase, the patient uh, has uh, come in with burns and you are supporting, uh, supporting their life at that moment, uh, giving fluids, uh, you know, trying to stop infection. The acute phase, would be the treatment of the burn uh, until it's healed. And then rehabilitative phase, um, you are now uh, getting that patient back to as close to their baseline as possible. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, burns cause scar tissue. Scar tissue is really great at being scar tissue. Scar tissue is not great at being anything else. It's not great at being skin. If you have all, if you have a large area of skin replaced by scar tissue, uh, it doesn't have any of the other structures. So in the rehab phase, uh, say your patient uh, who was burned on their arm and it was burned across the joint, as that skin healed and the scar tissue formed, scar tissue is not really stretchy. So it may impact the uh, patient's ability to move that joint, and that is something that will have to be addressed uh, during the rehabilitative phase. So resuscitative phase, what are we doing? Vital signs, okay? Respiratory status. Even if that burn isn't to the face or to the chest, well, if you don't have A, B, and C, don't matter. Oxygen therapy. 
your tissues need two things to function properly. You need oxygen and you need glucose. When your body is trying to repair itself and it's responding to this uh, trauma that is the burn, uh, now obviously a little sunburn uh, is not going to require oxygen therapy, but uh, big burns to large areas of the body, Patient's going to want some supplemental oxygen with that um, to pack as much oxygen into uh, into the area as they can, so that the cells can make energy and heal themselves. Uh, maintaining fluid and electrolyte balance. One thing that the skin does great is it keeps the bacteria out and it keeps all the juicy stuff in because we are made of juicy stuff. We are made of meat. If the skin is impaired by a burn, uh, not only do we have the fluid loss as the body is trying to get materials to that site to repair it, but we also have evaporation. Um, fluids can be lost uh, rather heavily, especially in large areas of burns. Um, recording accurate I's and O's, um, CNAs. I's and O's are not just busy work. It doesn't matter if they're burn patients or not. Eyes and O's are a very important measure that we as nurses and you becoming nurses uh, must have accurately so that we can get a better handle on what our fluid balance for that patient is. Right, so Accurate I's and O's, very important in, in all cases, burn cases especially since they run uh, such a high risk of dehydration. Renal function, um, making sure that the kidneys are still working, supporting, that, uh, uh, supporting renal function during this time. Um, infection, right? Treating and preventing infection and pain management obviously because burns hurt. Uh, massive burns hurt pretty massively. In the acute phase, applying topical agents to protect the skin, protect the underlying tissues, um, providing for some debridement of dead tissue from the wounds. Uh, we've got and debridement can take uh, can take the form of dressing changes even to surgical debridement to scrubbing of the wound bed itself in a sterile procedure to remove the dead tissue from the site of the burn um, and this would be in preparation as well for skin grafting um, other care management priorities uh, remembering that your burn patient may not just be fighting having a burn. Um, there may be other issues like renal failure, compromised airway, right? In the acute phase, uh, we are still managing those pieces. Um, could be pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Uh, so as we are treating the burn, we cannot forget about the patient's health history. And then the rehab. Uh, so rehabilitative services, there is a lot that these patients are going through. They can have complications uh, of the burns with immobility. Um, loss of the, depending on the uh, extent of the burn, um, so consider that scar tissue is great at being scar tissue. It is not great at being anything else. In the skin, we have sweat glands, right? helps us to regulate body temperature. If the patient has a huge amount of burned skin that is now replaced with scar tissue, their ability to regulate their body temperature can and will be impaired. Okay, so there are, there are other health complications of the burn just besides say, or as a result of the effect of the burn. Emotional aspects, burns can be dis disfiguring um, and there will be definitely some uh, emotional uh, support and counseling. 
discharge planning, which as for anything starts on admission. All right, the discharge planning for the patient with burns uh, will have to account for any physical, um, lasting physical uh, deformities uh, or inabilities to perform ADLs. And in the last piece we have is our prognosis, uh, what it looks like, uh, the likelihood of the patient's return to baseline normal function. <clears throat> now for minor burns. First aid, don't use ice. Right? Cool the area for 10 or 4 more minutes or until the pain diminishes. Do not use ice because ice in itself can cause tissue damage. Um, ever hear of freezer burn? Um, I believe there was one of those idiotic challenges going on here a while back with ice and salt and people getting scarred up and uh, and losing tissue from an internet challenge. Add that to the list of many things I just don't understand. Um, if the, so we say cover the burn with sterile gauze. If it's a blister that has popped, then we use sterile gauze. If it's not blistered, if it's a, just a minor first degree burn, obviously we don't have to cover it with sterile gauze because the skin is not impaired. Relieve the pain, monitor the site. If we have a, a, a nice little partial thickness burn with lots of blisters, we want to make sure that those blisters don't pop. And if they do pop, then we have to uh, keep the area clean and uh, dress them with the sterile dressings because once it's popped, now we have an opening, uh, a portal for infection. If it hasn't broken, we have no portal for infection. So what do you think? Bed cradle. Bed cradle. So this is a framework. Think of it as a greenhouse for your feet that, uh, or a greenhouse for the body that uh, keeps the blankets off of uh, direct contact with the patient. So what do you think? Must always use a bed cradle when uh, packing the legs? If you said true, yes, right? Prevents wicking, prevents loss of body temperature, and provides insulation to help the patient maintain their body temperature and not go hypothermic. Debridement, sterile procedure. Uh, loose skin, dead tissue may happen when changing packs, when, uh, when the wound has been packed, moist, uh, moist wound packing. Tissue may come, dead tissue may come out with, uh, with those dressing changes. Congratulations, you have just debrided a wound. Um, and that is for more than just burns. Okay, it can be pressure ulcers, it can be uh, traumatic wounds, anything that, uh, that is being packed or has dead tissue. Um, debreeding happens when, uh, when addressing the, or taking care of the dressings, right? You've got autolysis or autolysis, again, depending on where you trained, who you trained with, um, but uh, autolytic, that's your body's natural processes breaking down the uh, breaking down the dead tissue and, uh, and getting rid of it. Um, enzymatics, enzymatic debridement uh, using uh, gel containing enzymes that are breaking down the dead tissue. Mechanical debridement, uh, and that can be when the dressing is uh, being removed and those pieces are coming with it down to including uh, picking with tweezers uh, or a scrub brush. And then surgical debridement, actually incising, cutting out, or excising, I should say, or cutting out the dead tissues. 
um, one that uh, isn't here uh, that bears uh, bears a little consideration is the use of uh, maggot therapy. Um, yes, filling the wound with maggots because they feast on the dead tissue and leave the live tissue alone. Um, these, now, these are not your average everyday campfire maggots. Uh, these are uh, maggots that are bred and raised for this purpose. They're sterile maggots. So the types of skin grafts. Uh, so here's a little bit of uh, medical terminology that uh, you're going to see again. Um, auto, allo, and hetero. Autograft. So came from the patient themselves, came from another area. I have skin grafts on my legs uh, and they took the, uh, the donor site from my hip. An allograft, uh, skin taken from a donor. Right? Now there is a potential for rejection here. Um, and then a hetero or a xenograft, um, that example would be using pig skin to form the matrix for skin to grow in, or fish. Um, that's uh, one that has been uh, seen more and more uh, lately is uh, using, I believe it's tilapia skin to form the framework because your body uh, with the pig skin or, uh, or the fish skin does not see that as a foreign invader where it might uh, from an allograft. Now, the what's this about the nursing process? So, the nursing process, this is how we function as nurses. The nursing process takes over your life. And pi. Let me flip the screen back for a second. And pi. Well, that's going to be sort of weird because uh, through this camera it comes up backwards. So, A would be assessment, gathering data. That is what we do. We are data gathering machines because we cannot really make an informed decision if we have not gathered the data. Next is a nursing diagnosis. There's an E there. Nursing diagnosis. Um, that is not a medical diagnosis. This is uh, this is what we as nurses. So a medical diagnosis would be diabetes. Uh, a nursing diagnosis would be risk for infection uh, due to uh, uncontrolled diabetes, as evidenced by big wound on foot. Anyway, we'll, you'll get to the uh, three-part nursing diagnosis as things go. Plan, that's the next stage. So I've got my data, I've figured out what's wrong. I'm gonna make a plan to fix it. All right, now I've made my plan. I'm gonna implement that plan. And then I'm going to evaluate, did it work? So this is the plan, this is the do it, this is the did it work. And oddly enough, evaluation, ties right back into assessment because you are assessing the situation to see if it worked. The nursing process, it is cyclical. It never stops. It takes over our lives and what we do. Let me go back to share screen here. So, oh yes, and pi. Everything and pi. There we go. All right, so back to nursing process. So data collection for burns, uh, fluid and electrolyte balance. 
Okay, are they dehydrated? Right. Um, electrolyte balance, uh, we may be looking at lab results. Okay, allergies, are they allergic to anything we're going to treat them with? Do we have any allergies? Um, do they need emotional support? Okay, planning and implementation. Once we have all this data, we can form our nursing diagnosis. We can create a plan to care for this patient. We can implement that plan, and then we go back to, hey, did it work? And that rolls all the way back around to data collection. Assessment is data collection. Evaluation is assessment of, did it work? Neoplasms, new growth, new growth or tumor, uh, possibly malignant or benign. Uh, the vast majority of neoplasms are benign. Does that mean they cannot cause dysfunction or trouble? No, you don't have to be malignant um, to create trouble. It all comes down to location. If that tumor is in a spot where it's impairing other functions, then it may be a benign tumor, uh, but it is uh, it is still a threat. Uh, malignant tumor, that's uh, one that is growing so fast and spreading, right? I think uh, non-malignant tumors, moles, birthmarks, keloid scars. Um, however, moles, uh, as we're going to look at the bottom of the page here. Uh, moles can turn bad. A mole can start out as nothing more than a mole, but it can further mutate and become cancerous. So skin cancers, uh, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell, malignant melanomas, these are all skin cancers, um, and they present differently. We're talking about moles, the ABCD rule, asymmetry. If the mole is nice and perfectly round, then it's not asymmetrical, it's, symm it's symmetrical, okay? So if we have asymmetry, that's one tick that says this is something I don't like. Uh, the border, is the border regular or is it irregular? Is it oval shaped or does it look like the state of Texas? Color, is it brown? Is it black? Is it red? And the diameter, is it small or is it large? And has there been a change in the diameter? Um, evaluating moles, very important, especially uh, for those with fair skin that spend a lot of time in the sun. I'm talking to you, my students who may, uh, you know, tan under a desk lamp. Um, this is uh, normally the point in face-to-face uh, -face classes where I start talking about your friend is SPF 1000 and big floppy hats. And yes, I know they don't actually make an SPF 1000, but the point still stands. Uh, those of you with very fair skin are at a great risk for skin cancer from sun exposure. So what do we think? True or false? Sun's rays between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. can be harmful to the skin. True. UVA and UBV, UVB, UVB, uh, UVB rays. These are the ones that uh, can cause the most damage to DNA. Uh, there's, a, there's another UV, it's UVC, but that is uh, generally taken out uh, pretty completely by the upper layers of the atmosphere. Um, UVC is the one that is used in sterilization lamps to kill off, uh, kill off bacteria and viruses and anything else that might get underneath it, okay? So between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., well, let's take a look.
Here we have the Earth. Here we have the atmosphere around the Earth. Not to scale. So in the morning, we're going to put Bob standing right here. In the morning, Bob standing out in the sunshine, that ray of light has to penetrate quite a bit of atmosphere. At nine in the morning, it's got to penetrate a little less atmosphere. Starting at 10, the amount of atmosphere that that ray of light has to penetrate is pretty small. That may or may not show up well on the video, but if so, humor me. The early and late sun, the rays have to go through a lot more atmosphere to reach Bob standing on the surface of the Earth and more of the UVA and UVB light has been blocked by the atmosphere. But uh, when the sun is directly overhead, that is the shortest distance through the atmosphere for that radiation to travel, and you get a stronger dose of UVA and UVB. That is that. Oh, here, here's a better picture. That would be Bob. Um, so enjoy. Uh, the next uh, the next homework is coming up. This will be uploaded here soon. And uh, next week we have chapter 77, uh, which video will be coming up here uh, in the next day or two. Um, any questions? Feel free to email, uh, drop a comment in the uh, in the comments underneath the video, and uh, I will be getting back to you as uh, as quickly as I am able. Have a great weekend.